You are listening to the Bethel Church Sermon Podcast, a ministry of Bethel Church in Yale, South Dakota. If you would, uh, take your Bibles and turn with me to Exodus. As you're turning there, uh, let me just draw your attention. I, I mentioned uh, the agreement, the, the covenant. Uh, in, in, my, in my prayer, I forgot to mention earlier, but there is a, a Bethel Church membership covenant. Uh, if you're not aware of that, uh, there is a, a handout like this on the presentation wall out there. Uh, you, can look at, you can look at that um, too. Just want to make sure that that is in front of you. Exodus chapter 9, we find ourselves in the seventh plague. We'll start in verse 13. If you would, stand with me as we honor the reading of Scripture. Then the Lord said to Moses, Rise up early in the morning and present yourself before Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, let my people go that they may serve me. For this time I will send all my plagues on you, on you yourself, and on your servants and your people, so that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. For by now I could have put out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, and you would have been cut off from the earth. Before this purpose, or for this purpose, I have raised you up to show you my power so that my name may be proclaimed in all of the earth. You are still exalting yourself against my people and will not let them go. Behold, about this time tomorrow I will cause a very heavy hail to fall, such as never been seen in all of Egypt from the day it was founded until now. Now, therefore, send, get your livestock and all that you have in the field into safe shelter. For every man and beast that is in the field and is not brought home will die when the hail falls on them. Then whoever feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh hurried his slaves and his livestock into the houses. But whoever did not pay attention to the word of the Lord left his slaves and his livestock in the field. And the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward heaven so that there may be hail in all of the land of Egypt on every man and beast and every plant of the field in the land of Egypt. Then Moses stretched out his staff toward heaven and the Lord sent thunder and hail and fire ran down from heaven and the Lord rained hail upon the land of Egypt. There was hail and fire flashing continually in the midst of the hail, very heavy hail such as never been in the land of Egypt since it became a nation. The hail struck down everything that was in the field in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and the hail struck down every plant of the field and broke every tree of the field. Only the land of Goshen, where the people of Israel were, there was no hail. Then Pharaoh Sent and called Moses and Aaron and said to them, This time I have sinned. The Lord is the Lord is in the right, and I and my people are in the wrong. Plead with the Lord, for there has been enough of God's thunder and hail. I will let you go, and you shall stay no longer. And Moses said to him, As soon as I have gone out of the city, I will stretch out my hand to the Lord, the thunder will cease. And I and will be no more hail, and you may know that the earth is the Lord's. But for you and your servants, I know that you do not fear the Lord, the God. The flax and the barley were struck down, for the barley was in the ear, and the flax in the bud. But the wheat and the emmer were not struck down, for they were late coming up. So Moses went out of the city from Pharaoh, stretched out his hands to the Lord, and the thunder and the hail ceased, and the rain no longer poured upon the earth. But when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunder had ceased, he sinned yet again. He hardened his heart, and he and his servants 
So the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people of Israel go, just as the Lord had spoken through Moses. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you would bless your word. Lord, we we know this is your word. Lord, we pray to you that you would speak to us through it and that your name would be exalted. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. If you remember a few weeks ago, the last time we were together in the book of Exodus, we started talking about the, the plague of, of hail. We focused in that message on the relationship between wrath and mercy. Let me just quickly uh, make that point. These plagues are a demonstration of God's wrath. That is clear, but what may not be so clear is that they're also a demonstration of God's mercy. For instance, let me make that, let me make that point. The, 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 the only reason that there is a seventh plague is because God is merciful in the sixth. Even the, the tenth plague, there, there is mercy in that it was the firstborn son that died Not them all. As he says in our text, in verse 15, For by now I could have put out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, and you would have been cut off from the earth. God could have done this, and and, and it would have been right. It would have been just. God would have been just and righteous just the same. But here we see his mercy and his patience. This is the thing that many people forget or fail to see when they're reading the Old Testament. They see violence. They see judgments of God. And they find themselves uh, not liking the God of the Old Testament. And they start longing for a God of of mercy and a God that, that is not wrathful. And we start making this distinction between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament because all we see is violence and bloodshed in the Old Testament, but we fail to see that the God of the Old Testament is actually a very merciful God. The writers of the Old Testament understood this very clearly. Bear with me for a moment. I want to illustrate this because I think it's important. Let's just start at the beginning. In Genesis 9, 16, we see the Lord being uh, merciful with Lot by bringing him safely out of the city before it was destroyed by fire and brimstone. Remember, mercy is not getting what one deserves. In, In other words, God could have let Lot burn and it would have been right. That's what he deserved, but instead God is merciful. In Exodus Chapter 34, verse 6, we have this statement about God. The Lord, the Lord is, the God is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. I mean, what, right? We, we thought the God of the Old Testament was, was judgment, was wrath. But here we read, he is merciful and gracious. The writers of the Old Testament get it. Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 31. For the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not leave you or destroy or forget the covenant with your fathers that he swore to them. In other words, here, there are those on one side of the covenant or agreement that did not live up to their end of it. Indeed, they could not live up to it, but God is merciful, and ultimately, his mercy is seen in Jesus Christ, who would take up the covenant and fulfill it on behalf of everyone who would trust in him, because they themselves couldn't. The Old Testament in Deuteronomy is pointing to Jesus, the covenant keeper. In 2 Chronicles chapter 30, verse 9, we read this. For if you return to the Lord, your brothers and your children will find compassion with their captors and return to his land. For the Lord, your God, is gracious and merciful and will not turn away from his his face from you if you return to him. 
Nehemiah 9.17, a reference back to, to Egypt. They refused to obey, and they were not mindful of the wonders that you performed among them, which is the plagues. They, but they stiffened their neck, and they appointed a, a leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. But you are a God ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and you did not forsake them. Psalms, Psalm 57. Look how the psalmist finds hope in God. It is in God's mercy. He says this, Be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me, for in my soul it takes for in you my soul takes refuge in the shadow of your wings I will take refuge till the storms of destruction pass by Psalm 103 verse 8 The Lord is merciful and gracious slow to anger abounding in you can almost finish it because it's repeated so many times steadfast love Psalm 111, verse 4. He has caused his wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and what? Merciful. Jeremiah chapter 3. So now we're in the, the major prophets. Jeremiah three twelve. Go, proclaim these words toward the north and say, Return, faithless Israel, declares the Lord. I will not look on you in anger, for I am merciful, declares the Lord. I will not be angry forever. Joel. Minor prophets, rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Even in the book of Jonah, God's mercy is why Jonah took off and ran the other direction. Just listen to Jonah chapter 4, verse 2. And he prayed to the Lord and said this, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made my haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. So, God is merciful, but yet... God turns to Egypt here and he pounds them with hail like they have never seen before. His power is on display and every living thing that is out is killed. It sounds harsh. It is wrath. But in it, we see God's mercy as well, right? God tells these people, this is going to happen. Just telling them is mercy. And then he says, here, you need to get inside to protect yourselves. If you don't go, out, if you don't go outside, you're going to be okay. Bring all your people inside. That's mercy. I, I read this article the other day about the, the flooding recently in Kentucky. What a, a horrible thing. And of course, I, I don't claim to know why God allowed that to happen. That's not my point. But scientists have looked at this, uh, this whole thing, and they can kind of explain in, in some degree why it happened. And their explanation was it was this repetitive meteorological event that was combined with a, a specific landscape in eastern Kentucky, and it was all sort of this perfect storm scenario. There was a, a stationary front that stayed in the, re the region for several days, and the result of this stationary front that stayed in the same place was what was called, and they have a name for it, training thunderstorms. And it's these thunderstorms that would just repeatedly move across the same area, the same region, over and over in a short amount of time, and usually cause flash flooding. Couple this with the geography of the area, it was disastrous to say the least. Upwards of, of 16 inches of rain fell in a, a five-day period, most of which happened in 24 hours. It was quite a situation. I know this is, this is flooding, not, not hail, and you might be asking, what is the, the similarity? But I do find it interesting that, that what happened here was a, a direct result of a, a stalled storm that, that sent storms over the, the same area and resulted in catastrophe. Sort of like what happened in Egypt. The storms were over a specific area, and it just kept pounding the, the same area over and over. And of course... 
In this situation, there was a lot of rain. But what if it was hail instead? I'm not suggesting what happened in Kentucky was the same thing as what happened in Egypt. That's not my point. I'm just saying that there's a, a bit of similarity here, enough to, to make a point and for us to, to think about. What if someone, for instance, came to the, the authorities, those in charge in eastern Kentucky, and said, this is going to happen. This, this rain is going to fall inches and inches of, of rain. It's going to come flooding. This is going to kill like 40 people and, and damage just hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars of property. What if he said that was going to happen if they continued in their hard-hearted stance toward God? What if there were six instances before that that gave great indication that this would happen? Because it happened before, over and over, just like God said. If they didn't stop, if they didn't stop what they were doing and worship the one true God, this is what's going to happen. I would say that guy wouldn't get reelected if he kept refusing. After six times, it seems like a no-brainer. Soften your heart. Relent. Stop holding on to your pride. Submit to the God who clearly has the power to destroy you. It isn't, it's, it, it's difficult to understand, isn't it? I'm talking about the, the seventh plague here. Why doesn't Pharaoh relent and let these people go worship their own God who clearly... At this point, who is clearly more powerful than all the so-called gods in Egypt. Of course, there's things in this that we may not understand, but we do understand that in this instance, God sent these plagues on, on Pharaoh and all of these people so that Pharaoh specifically would know that there is none like him in all of the earth. That's verse 14. I can't, I can't comprehend how some people do not and will not acknowledge God that there is no one like him in all of the earth. In fact, in these days, it, even, it, it isn't as if just people refuse to acknowledge him in their daily life, but it, it seems like they almost actively have to, I, I don't know the, the right word here, uh, wage war against him in, in the way they don't acknowledge him. For instance, the school board in, in Fargo, did you see this? They mixed the, the pledge, of, pledge of Allegiance from the, the school district because it, it had a reference to God in it. I was listening to the, the pathetic argument in the school board, and he, and he said that, since God, the word God, was capitalized, it meant that it must be the God of Christianity, and therefore it alienated everyone else. So nobody can say it. The whole pledge. Folks, this is, this is, this is much like the actions of Pharaoh here. That there was such a, a disdain for the God of the Hebrews that he refused to let them go, to serve the God that they worshipped. The one thing that they, they cared about. In the case of the school board in, in Fargo, these are refusing to let students even acknowledge God in the Pledge of Allegiance. Which is not an allegiance to God, by the way, but an allegiance to the flag. It's a, a reference, a passing reference to God in an act of patriotism. That is hostility. That's Again, I don't waging war against a God that you don't want any part of. In all of this, we must remember that God is patient. Not only is God merciful, and his mercy is seen in wrath, but God is extremely patient. We wage war. Over and over. I May mean, I give one illustrate? Over and over. We wage war. God is patient. In 2 Peter chapter 3, we learn that one day is as a, a thousand to the Lord. That verse has been used uh, over and over in some very strange ways. But let me suffice it to say this. That God doesn't see time as we do. There are those that, that would say something like this. Look at the world all around us. Look at the, the evil 
Look at how people are, are raising up and, and waging war against God. There's just such disdain for him. Look at the world, all the evil in it. Why doesn't God just wrap it all up? Why doesn't God drop the, the final judgment already? Why doesn't God just bring about the, the consummation of all things Why doesn't God complete his his promise, right? His promise to wrap it all up and save those who are his and and deal with with sin and and death and and all of this forever. Why doesn't he just do it already? Why is he letting the world be so evil? To this, Peter says clearly, God does not see time the same way you and I do. In fact, and this is verse 9, God is not slow to fulfill his promise His promise, the final salvation of his elect, the consummation of all things, the final judgment. God isn't being slow, but he's being patient. God's patience will last, get this, God's patience will last until every single person that will come to Christ comes to Christ. God will be patient. And when these all have come to him, then he will set everything right. Just listen to the verses right after that. And I'll I'll read verse 9 so you catch the, the patience part. God is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Judgment. So do you see what the promise there is in verse 9? God is not slow concerning his promise. The promise is the end of all things. It's the telos. The end for which everything has been leading and pointing. History is heading in a single direction and the fact is it will end just as God said it would end. For the time being, God is being patient. And make no mistake, he's patient. He was patient with Pharaoh. He's patient with the school board in Fargo that refuses to acknowledge him and and makes these kind of warlike statements. And he's patient with you and I. I look back on my own life and it boggles my mind. I can't explain it. It, it seems to me that it, it wouldn't have been worth, worth it for God to pour so much time and energy into me. In other words... I can't comprehend why God was so patient with me. I can't comprehend why God is still being so patient with me. This is the beauty of the gospel for the the believer, isn't it? The law, on one side, what God wants of us, highlights our own inability. It highlights how we continually fall short. We do not live up to what God asks of us. But the gospel continually highlights the fact that Jesus excelled where we failed, that he paid for our sins. And in and of ourselves, we are not worth the time and the effort. In and of ourselves, there's no reason for God to be patient with us. But in God's plan, he has set his almighty gaze on us that he decided, determined that he was going to be patient with us and wait for you and I to come to faith in Christ, waiting for us to repent, to turn from our sinfulness and embrace Jesus Christ, the only one that can save us from our plight. Perhaps you're here this morning and you're not there yet. You've not put your your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. I want you to recognize that God is being patient with you. He he could have taken you out. He He could have done that. Because our sin deserves that. Just as we read about Pharaoh, that God could have taken him out with a plague and he would have been just and right to take us out too. But the fact that you're here this morning, that you're listening to this message demonstrates that God is patient. But remember this. God is not patient forever. The fact is, we don't know when our lives will end. 
We don't know when God will come and, and set things to right. Second Peter, we read that the end is, is going to come like a thief. And the point there is that it will be unexpected. My friend, please understand, God is merciful. He's gracious. He's patient. But he's also just, and he will in no way let sin go unpunished. Either we will bear the weight of our own sin for all of eternity in a devil's hell, or for those who have placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that weight of our sin, the wrath of God was poured out on Jesus Christ in our place. You see, God is just and sin must be dealt with. So I plead with you this morning that if you are here and, and your heart has been hard toward God, if you've mistaken his, his patience and his mercy with you for, for impotence, an inability to act, or, or a God that just doesn't care, or a God that doesn't take sin seriously, my friend, you are gravely mistaken. My friend, repent. Repentance is simply changing your mind about sin. It's, it's changing from the mindset that sin isn't serious. Sin isn't damaging. It's changing from liking our sinfulness to a mindset that said, says that, that sin is, is serious. It's an act of cosmic treason against God. It's violating God's right standard. And it's punishable by etern eternal death. In other words, sin is damnable. Do you see how repentance is a change of mind? It's a change of mind that has drastic implication on how one lives. If you now think of sin as something that God hates, something that is damnable and destructive, you will desire to live differently, won't you? My friend, today is the day to turn to Jesus Christ in faith, to embrace him as your only hope in life and death. That he is the only remedy for our guilt before an all-holy God. That it was him that lived for you, died for you, rose again in victory over sin and death for you. I want to say something else here before I leave this, this plague. The hail here was, was such a great demonstration of God's power and might. It prompted Pharaoh to call Moses and Aaron back to him. And notice what he says. This time, I have sinned. The Lord is right. And I and my people are in the wrong. Plead with the Lord. For there has been enough of God's thunder and hail. I will let you go. And you shall stay no longer. So the question is, was Pharaoh repentant? It seemed like he, he recognized his sin. He, he says that he was in the wrong. He says that the Lord was right. Well, we know that what we have here is a, a false confession. And that it wasn't really, he wasn't really repentant. We know that this because we know the, the rest of the story. We know that his, his heart is, is hard. He refuses again and again to let pe God's people go to worship uh, their own God. So what is wrong here? What is wrong with what Pharaoh did? What are the, the marks of a true repentant heart? These are important questions for us to consider. Now, <clears throat> Thomas Watson, a, period, a Puritan author, wrote a small but important book entitled The Doctrine of Repentance. In that book, the, the second chapter, it, it's on uh, counterfeit repentance. And, and here I, I really think that he nails what's happening in the heart of Pharaoh. Watson says this, quote, A man has gone along in his sin. At last God arrests him, shows him what desperate hazard he has run, and he is filled with anguish. Doesn't that sound like what's happening here? Pharaoh is an adulterer. He is refusing to, to heed the command of God. He is going along in his sin, and it is now the, the seventh plague, and he admits that he has sinned. God has shown him what a desperate hazard he has run, as Watson puts it. Watson goes on to say that a, a person in this state might be satisfied where they have recognized sin and they felt sorrow or, or bitterness in sin. But then Watson says this, and I quote, Do not be deceived. 
This is not repentance. It is one thing to be a terrified sinner and another thing to be a repenting sinner. Sense of guilt is enough to breed terror. Infusion of grace breeds repentance. Now, <clears throat> grasp what he is saying because this is really important. There are those who are shown their sin and there are those who, who know that the terror of it just think of the, the convicted murderer through the process of being convicted. He is showing his, his crime, and when he's sentenced, he sees the, the seriousness of it. Perhaps the, the weight and terror of, of prison for such a long time breeds in him a, a heart determination to never do that thing again. And he, he doesn't want to go back to prison, so is that repentance? No. Because the, the terror and trouble of sin, although it is important... But if it were enough for true repentance, then the damned in hell should be the most penitent because they are in the most anguish over their sin. That's how Watson put it. I would suggest that this is where Pharaoh is at. He experienced the, the terror and, and trouble of, of sin. He's felt anguish there, but there's no grace there's no transformed heart. There, there's no change of mind about sin. What he is concerned with is the consequences and the trouble that sin is causing in his life. True repentance has trouble with sin, not just the terror that it causes. A, a true repentant heart is sorrowed by the sin itself, not only the anguish caused by it. And that's a pretty important distinction. And Watson is exactly right here when he says that true repentance is a grace. One cannot be truly repentant apart from the grace of God. So the question then is, well, what? that's not repentance. So what does true repentance look like? I think Watson does a wonderful job of outlining this in his book as well. <clears throat> it's, it's important, though, we start with what repentance or what we mean by it, Watson simply defined, defines repentance this way. Repentance is a grace of God's spirit whereby the sinner is inwardly humbled and visibly reformed. I like that. First, it's a grace. It's God wrought. It's something that God does. It's a result of God's action in your life. It's divinely created. Second, it's something that happens within a person that has outward implication. Repentance isn't outward that changes the inward. Repentance is an inward thing that has implications coming out. So what does true repentance look like? According to, to Watson, there are six ingredients to this spiritual medicine. And if one of them is, is, mini, is missing, it, it lacks all virtue, he says. It, it, you you got to have them all or your recipe is spoiled. Let me give you them quickly. The first he said is the sight of sin. Sight of sin. This is uh, clearly seen in the story of the, the prodigal son where we read that this, this boy who, who left in his rebellion, he comes to himself. He saw himself as a, a sinner at the core. That's who he was. Watson says it this way. Before a man can come to Christ, he must come to himself. In other words, he must understand himself to be a sinner. He must see himself as God sees him, a spiritual rebel, a divine lawbreaker. Secondly, there must be sorrow for sin. Not a sorrow for getting caught in sin, not a sorrow for the agony that sin has caused, but a sorrow for sin. We see sin for what it is, and when we see sin for what it is, there's no, it follows naturally. We're sorry for it. Watson says it this way A woman may as well expect to have a child without pangs as one can expect repentance without sorrow. Third, there's a confession of sin. A confession of sin. Again, confession just naturally flows from sorrow. Ambrose called uh, sorrow the embittering of the soul. The, the Hebrew word that's translated to be sorrowful carries the, the image of the soul being crucified. So naturally, this kind of sorrow for sin has a vent. Watson says it this way, it vents itself in the eyes by weeping and at the tongue by confession. 
What is confession, you ask? Well, it's self Accusation, it's admittance of one's sin and guilt. It's not coerced, it's voluntary. It affects the, the person, it's sincere, sincere acknowledgement of one's sin against an all holy God. In other words, it's taking the blame. Our sin is on us, it's not on God. It doesn't blame other people, it admits faults, it recognizes the consequences and assumes them to be yours. So we have sight for sin, sorrow for sin, confession of sin, and then we need to add shame for sin. There's shame for sin. Watson says that the blushing is the color of virtue. When the heart has been made black with sin, grace makes the face red with blushing. Just think about the seriousness of sin. And Watson outlines this very well. But every sin makes us guilty before God. Every little sin is, is guilt. Sin is akin to unthankfulness to God. Our sin puts Christ to shame over and over again. The Christ who came to deal with our sin once and for all. So yes, repentance involves shame for sin. What sin continually does. What we see today on a large scale in the Christian world is not shame over sin, but excuses and workarounds when it comes to sin. We tell ourselves that everyone sins, therefore sin isn't that big a deal. But in the seriousness of sin, it demands that we are ashamed of that kind of behavior toward God. We should be ashamed of ourselves. Now think about what would naturally flow from this from confession of sin to the shame of one's sin, wouldn't it be a hatred of sin? The point here is clear. One cannot be repentant and still have an affinity with their sin. The point of all of this is simple, and it just naturally follows that the one that sees it and is sorrowed because of their sin naturally confesses it and hates it. They're ashamed by it. They hate it. They want to mortify it and kill it in their life. Watson says it this way. How far are they from repentance who instead of hating sin, love sin? To the godly, sin is a thorn in the eye. To the wicked, it's a crown on their head. It, do you see the, the difference? If, if you love your sin, it's a crown on your head. If you're a, a Christian, your repentance is a thorn in your eye. You can't have a middle ground. So the point here is simple. Truly repentant people have changed their mind when it comes to sin. It, it says as the Apostle Paul says it, right? The sin has become exceedingly sinful. It isn't a cause for glory, and it certainly isn't an occasion to rejoice. But because of the work of the Holy Spirit, sin becomes repugnant, and therefore it is utterly hated in the life of the believer. Now, the final ingredient in this holy mixture is a, a turning from sin. You hate it, it naturally you turn from it. I, I do find it curious that this is the, the way that many people choose to define repentance. Repentance is turning from sin. It's a 180, some people might say. Is that true? It, it is, but it isn't all there is. Repentance is a lot. The, the fact is, when the Lord works in an individual, He changes the heart. He gives them a, a heart of flesh. They become a new creature. They're born again. Does all of this have implication on the outward actions of an individual? Absolutely they do. But that isn't at all. Repentance is a change of mind. It's a change of attitude. It's a heart change toward sin that has implications on the outside. But to focus solely on outward actions and to minimize uh, the rest is a grave mistake. The fact is, turning from sin has been implied with about every other ingredient that we mentioned. You have sorrow for sin, you're going to turn from it. Confession of sin, you're going to turn from it. It follows, right? The one who hates their sin, 
will not desire to continue in it. Watson says it this way, true repentance, like nitric acid, eats asunder the iron chain of sin. Therefore, weeping and turning, weeping over sin and turning are put together. When we think about this, we realize pretty quickly that Pharaoh's repentance was not genuine in, in several of these agreements. He, he wasn't truly repentant. He lacked faith in the one true God. He might have had an awareness of God's power, an awareness of his, his sin, but that doesn't translate into a, a faith that saves. I, I want you to understand something. And we, we call this in, in theology the order salutis. It's the order of salvation. It sounds more complicated than it is. Basically, what we are doing here is we're taking the elements of salvation and we're putting them in a, a logical order so that we can understand what happens. And why this is so important is we must affirm that regeneration, that's new birth, being born again, comes before conversion. And when I say conversion, what I mean by that is faith and repentance. So, Born again comes before faith. Some say, well, wait a minute. Faith has to come before regeneration. Well, the problem there is that makes new birth a product of the human will. Not the product of a divine act. And essentially, one is responsible for their own salvation, and we can't have that. Now, why this is important is that faith and repentance, conversion is a product of what God has done. It's a divine grace. It's unmerited favor. One cannot, get this, one cannot conjure up biblical repentance just like one cannot conjure up a faith that justifies. My point here is simple. When you see these ingredients of true repentance, the proper response is not, have I repented enough? Have I done enough? Did I do it right? Could I do more? What if I didn't do it quite right? Maybe I'm not really repented because I, I didn't have enough sorrow. I didn't cry enough. I didn't do all of this. I'm not suggesting that you do more. I'm only suggesting that you rest in what Christ has done for you. That is that he has taken your sin. And if God is at work in your heart, you are seeing your sin for what it is. That it was laid on Christ, not on you. There's great sorrow for it. There's guilt there's shame. There's admitting that. There's this hatred for it because you realize this is what Christ died for. There's an awareness of sin and we humbly admit that sin would damn us if it were not for Christ who took upon himself to save us from it. Who died in our place. Who bore the wrath that we deserved. You see, if you're here this morning and you're not a believer, if you have never trusted Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, I pray that the Holy Spirit would open your eyes this morning that you would see that the truth and the beauty of the gospel, that what Jesus has done for you would be plain and that you would turn to him and you would trust him and there would be this kind of divine God-wrought repentance in your life, that you would see your sin for what it is and you would hate it and desire to turn from it. If you're a believer, we should pray that the Lord would use this reminder of what repentance looks like in our life and ask the Lord to make us aware of areas in which we continue to fall short because we all do. We all still sin. We all have areas in our hearts that we're blind to and we pray that the Lord would work in our hearts that we would see our sin that we would hate it and we would continue to, to turn to Christ, to rest in Christ and, and trust in what he has done for us. And that God would continue to, to move us and, and grant us into true repentance. To sorrow and hatred for sin that ultimately we might turn from it. Let's pray together. And then I'll, I'll invite Jesse to, to come up. Or sing, we'll sing first and then I'll ask Jesse to come up after we sing. Okay? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you and thank you so much for your word. We thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for the fact that, that he came and, and lived a, a perfect life, excelled in, in every way that we've fallen short. Lord, we thank you for salvation, the forgiveness of sins. We pray that if there are those here 
that haven't placed their faith and trust in you, those listening, Lord, we pray that, that you would open their eyes. We pray that they would, they would trust you to today. Lord, that they wouldn't be objects of your wrath, that they wouldn't bear that. Lord, we thank you so much for being merciful and, and patient with us. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't take advantage of that. Lord, I pray that you would accomplish many things through your word this morning. Encourage us, draw us closer to you. Lord, we pray that you would be honored in all of these things. Thank you for listening to this sermon resource from BethelMBChurch.org. If you'd like to learn more about Bethel Church or find other resources, please visit our website at BethelMBChurch.org. Bethel Church exists to bring glory to God by promoting the joyful worship of Jesus Christ both here and abroad.